losing time, I'm fading fast I just wanna make it last Try to let go of the past I close my eyes, embrace the blast Sleepless nights and headaches stack Restlessness to hell and back What's my purpose, what do I grab? A slippery surface, a heart attack And sometimes you just gotta believe Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. This is part four in debunking Gladwell's analysis of Amanda Knox. In this section we're going to be dealing with the classic um, criticism of the Knox case that the police investigation was flawed, the prosecutor was some kind of weirdo and you know that whole sort of side of it now what's really interesting with the Knox case if you thick slice it is um, from the beginning you have the sort of idea of we're not going to talk about Amanda Knox we should talk about Rudy Gaudet um, we shouldn't um, be worried about XYZ uh, what about Patrick Lumumba that that that's her that was her own response um, in terms of the narrative around the, the sort of sides of the, the Amanda Knox debate, let's talk about Nick Pisa. Let's sort of criticize him as a journalist. Um, in terms of explaining all the away, all the sort of strangeness around Amanda Knox's behavior, well, that's due to her goofiness. Um, in terms of the um, court narrative, uh, how do we just dismiss that? Oh, it's the Italian justice system. Um, and so basically you have an endless array of sort of things that you place almost as obstacles where you say we're not going to talk seriously about the Amanda Knox case because there's so many other reasons not to and what it ends up being whether you whether you go from Patrick Lumumba which was a bogus narrative to let's only concentrate on Rudy Gaudet which is a somewhat less bogus narrative to um, Nick Pisa is the villain in the story to uh, oh, th uh, we can explain everything because Amanda Knox is goofy to the Italian justice system um, is flawed. That's why everything happened. Um, this didn't happen because someone was murdered and Amanda Knox lived right next door and there were problems with the story. No, it's, it's a problem because of the Italian justice system. Um, you know, they are just a bunch of crazy fools, blah, blah, blah. So you have all these... Um, things thrown up almost like someone throwing pasta at the ceiling and you know you, in Italy you tend to, and, and Italian restaurants you tend to know where, past, where the pasta is ready uh, if it sticks and so this is exactly what they did uh, the people involved in tasks with the defense of Amanda Knox were just throwing pasta up at the ceiling and seeing what, what has stuck one of the things that has stuck probably better than anything else is this sort of criticism of the Italian justice system and of course this plays into the bias that um, all things American are superior to all other things um, the Americans are superior to the Italians and the Americans are superior to the British and not only that their law systems are superior and you know someone accused of murder, murder can't be guilty because they they're, they're above reproach just like the justice system is um, if you take that argument and you say how great the American justice system is, you can just as quickly talk about the O.J. Simpson trial and Casey Anthony and Stephen Avery. And no matter how you want to slice it, um, those aren't uh, sterling examples of cases that have gone any way where one would say justice was served. Um, another potential example is the West Memphis 3 case. No matter what side of the um, story you stand on um, you've got to say that well, that was quite a messy case in terms of justice even if you take a case that was reasonably simple like Jody Arias um, where you know she even photographed the, the murder uh, effectively um, you've got photographic evidence of it and absolutely convincing evidence of lying on the stand and they still couldn't sentence her to death. I mean, a lot of people said if there was ever a case that qualified for the death sentence, this was it, and that didn't happen either. And you, you kind of had a separate trial just about that, about sentencing Jody Arias to death, and you, you end up with a hung jury. So, you know, if you want to make 
criticisms about justice, um, you can you can really have a field day, and and it's certainly not a case where you could say that from one country to the next. Um, there are very different scenarios in different countries. So, for example, in America, you have jury systems, and um, you know you could easily criticize that aspect. You could say. You know, you could rig juries, for example, in the O.J. Simpson uh, case, where you can you can have a you can pre um, you can sort of anticipate the end of the trial simply by choosing the right jury member. You know, and we know that in the civil trial there was a different result. Um, in a country like South Africa, you don't have juries, and and I think one of the reasons is because you would have a problem with um, because of the of, of the racial um, um, situation in the country, you, you wouldn't want a situation where you have, for example, a uh, white jury judging a black um, perpetrator or vice versa. And even so, you, you still kind of have a situation now where you have um, people being accused of certain crimes and then they judge by a per- person of certain color. And then that's considered, well, you know, can one rely on this? Because, you know, there's a lot of public enmity or whatever the case may be. So um, there are advantages to a jury system and there are disadvantages. If you take the extreme, say the jury system in South Africa, which doesn't even have a jury, um, then Italy sort of falls kind of in the middle. They've got a jury, it's smaller, and it doesn't have to be a unanimous vote. Um, so there's more to say about that, but but let's get um, let's get cracking with um, Gladwell itself. Now um, to deal with w- what we're dealing with in in Gladwell's book, talking to strangers, we had around about forty percent in the Kindle version of the book. Um, we had location one nine five four of four nine three zero, although uh, we're a little bit further than that. We actually. Uh, dealing with what we're dealing with today is at uh, as, at about 41%. So we've sort of gone from 40% in the chapter dealing with Knox to 41%. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a there's a section that I've highlighted on the blog post, uh, mostly in yellow, but it basically starts off with um, Gladwell's uh, cliched criticism of the police, um, and once again. This is almost as if Gladwell hasn't read the material, hasn't read the court case, and is simply sort of repeating some of the obvious um, low-hanging fruit stuff that's associated with the Knox case. And um, when he refers to the police investigation against Knox being revealed as shockingly inept, I'm not really sure what he means. Uh, how was it revealed as shockingly inept? Um, you've kind of got to use examples to um, specific examples to demonstrate that. And I don't know why he doesn't really. Um, certainly in this piece. So a great example, if you wanted to explain why the police investigation was inept, you could say, um, you know the the bra clasp that had been cut off from uh, Meredith's back, you know, the, the bra clasp had been literally sliced off with a knife, um, was identified by um, an investigator. And if we go by the version in Darkness Descending, uh, on page 80 dealing with the lab detectives, um, there is a little anecdote about... Um, Someone, a lab technician called, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Gioia Brocchi. I'm not quite sure how how to pronounce it, but it's G-I-O-I-A. It's the person's name and surname B-R-O-C-C-I. And um, this refers to the frustration of the lab personnel who were sort of... um, kind of in an enormous crime scene. It was sort of messy, it was all over the place. There were also so many personnel, they were sort of stepping over each other. Um, you were also had a situation where they were sort of searching all over for fingerprints and they were f- kind of struggling to find fingerprints. And 
and then you would sometimes find fingerprints associated with blood and as soon as you did that as soon as you try to take a print where there was blood then you kind of had to make a call because as soon as you use the gray powder associated with extracting a print then that's going to destroy the sample in terms of um, finding DNA. So, so they, they had these frustrating choices to make with whether to try and find a print and to find um, or to find DNA. Um, but in, in terms of this particular uh, uh, lab technician, uh, probably uh, CSA, um, you had someone who was getting fatigued uh, you know two or three days into the analysis of the crime scene and she identified the um, her job was to number and identify the artifacts and she identified the um, piece of the bra and but then it came down to the change of change of a shift and somewhere between changing that shift um, the bra clasp wasn't um, identified and it kind of got lost right and unfortunately that was a very critical um, aspect um, you would then get a narrative saying so so bear in mind obviously the the police didn't um, perform effectively or professionally in that aspect uh, on a critical piece of evidence but then you also have the converse um, you know how is the defense going to explain how solicitor's DNA got into not only the villa, not only into Meredith's room, but onto the bra clasp that was under a mattress in the room. And it's a very um, personal, intimate um, piece of evidence. And as we say, it's evidence that was sliced off from Meredith's um, bra, from, from her back and you know who who was someone who carried a knife wherever he went right so um obviously there is some reasonable doubt here but but you if you play devil's advocate and you say how are you going to explain even in, in a reasonable defense case how celeste's dna got where it did and you won't believe it but the explanation was something along the lines that DNA on dust got sort of carried from the um, somewhere else in the villa into Meredith's room via you know someone say walking into the room and then this DNA uh, trace that sort of floating on like the magic carpet of a speck of dust then magically settled onto the bra cloth you know like a, a very crucial piece of evidence and um, that is a patently ridiculous scenario to sketch but it's quite an imaginative one once that's in your mind you can you can sort of not get rid of it um, DNA is kind of a, a, a strange thing with true crime it's both easy to leave behind and difficult so for example if you are dressed from head to foot in in clothing say gloves or a mask or something you're not easily going to leave DNA behind on the other hand um, DNA can be quite easily deposited if there's something like a wound um, if there is any kind of leaking of bodily fluid so in that sense it can be quite easily left behind but just to give one just to give a a sense of um, how little of Celeste's DNA uh, we're dealing with. Um, the only only other trace of Celeste's DNA in in Amanda's apartment, and we know that he he was there. In fact, we know he was there the, the day of Meredith's death, earlier in the day, was was uh, on a cigarette bud, um, I think, uh, left in an ashtray. That's the that's the only trace of his um, DNA, and then of course. Uh, on the bra clasp. So, um, what really beggars belief is when you have narrators like Malcolm Gladwell who focus on the botched investigation, but they don't talk about if the investigation wasn't botched, um, what would, where would the DNA have led you? What, what was the DNA actually saying? 
and I don't know if you had to mention this idea of DNA, you know, on a magic carpet ride onto Meredith's blog broadcast, whether whether Gladwell would say, yeah, that makes sense to him. I don't know whether he would have heard it before or or not, but uh, you know, it's strange that he's not having that argument, simply just avoiding it, which seems a bit convenient. Um, the other aspect which I think isn't being uh, acknowledged is uh, it's easy to say that the police investigation was inept um, as, as a sort of a sweeping statement, you know, just to say, oh, the whole, the whole thing was, was inept. But um, the fact is um, someone found Meredith's phone uh, phones in their garden and called the police. Um, they didn't need to do that. Um, they could have taken the phones for themselves or they could have just shrugged or they could have not found the phones. Any any of a long list of things could have happened. But as it happened, someone found Meredith's phones. I don't think the perpetrator, the person who threw the phones, they anticipated this. But you literally had this as a surprise. Um, when the police arrived at the scene, it wasn't to investigate a murder, it was simply to find out, um, you know, to give the phones back to Meredith or to find out um, how she'd lost her phones. And as it turned out, that was well-founded. So, yeah, you actually have an excellent example of the opposite. You have an example of someone's phones being stolen and this leading to a vital interference of the police into something that was actually much larger, right? I hope that's that's clear. Then you not only have the postal po police arriving, you have other police arriving as well. And um, and who calls them? Um, they they called by the prime suspect, who calls to um, talk about something else. And th this is a part that I find uh, happens so often and it seems very schizophrenic with people talking about true crime. Is you'll have a crime reported as something, often by people that are um, uh, sus suspects or have some kind of sinister relationship with the crime scene, if one can put it that way. And then the police simply um, honor the request of the person calling and then, and then they get into trouble for that. So I'll give an example. In John Benet Ramsey, um, the police are confronted with a situation that is told to them by very respectable people that they are dealing with a kidnapping. And so that's how they deal with it. They, they deal with a situation based on what is given to them by the family. Uh, he has a ransom note. We, our daughter's gone, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you criticize the police and you say um, the police did, well, really, should the police be criticized or should the narrative that, that was um, misleading to begin with be criticized? And then you can also say, was it purposefully misleading? So I, I find that a little bit disingenuous from a lot of people where you say, no, the police are, um, are at fault. How can they be at fault when they, you know, if you are the police and, and someone calls you, um, and you get a 911 call and you're brand new to a situation, you're behind in terms of the dynamics and the evidence and, and the person, I guess, involved is now giving you the intelligence and, and the intelligence is wrong. How do you then come afterwards and then blame the police for initially um, taking what you're saying at face value? I mean, are the police supposed to immediately sort of snap their fingers, wave a magic wand and immediately know everything that's going on. I mean, it's impossible. That's why you have an investigation. That's why you investigate the evidence, right? So in the Amanda Knox case, you have the same thing where someone calls in to report a burglary and the people who should call in to report the phone missing and all sorts of other things don't. And so when the police arrive there, they, they are confused. And just to sh make the point even further, um, you have um, the coroner, the pathologist who did the autopsy on Meredith Kircher, couldn't say whether Meredith was raped or not. So he's basically um, doing his um, 
assessment, he's examining the body and he's looking at it and he's saying, there does seem to be something going on here. There does seem to be um, sexual interference or sexual, envir- or sexual violence of some kind. But I'm not sure exactly what it is. I, I'm, not sh- I, I'm not sure if she was raped. Um, and, and then he goes on to say, well, or someone, someone um, reveals that Meredith was actually fully clothed when she died. Um, fully clothed, as in uh, wearing her jeans, wearing her panties, wearing her bra, wearing her jumper. Um, and that her clothes were removed after she died which then also asks the question was the rape simulated or was the sexual aspect simulated or contrived and so you do have a situation that is confusing you can't blame the police for that Um, you can blame the police for um, uh, making mistakes like with the um, with the bra class but you can't then wave the flag at that alone and say this is now the sole narrative of the Amanda Knox case. It's one aspect of it. And if you want to mention um, strange things that the police did or didn't do, you can, you can um, refer to just as many that Amanda Knox did or didn't do. Um, y- for example, you had Amanda Knox telling everyone that she discovered the body when when everyone wanted to look into the room except Knox and Celesito. And a situation like that does suggest that they already knew what was behind the door. They didn't need to look behind the door because they um, already knew. I'm saying that's what it suggests. Um, Everyone else is trying to look inside because they don't know what's going on. They're trying to see if Meredith's okay. But Amanda Knox has no need to do that. And then afterwards she tells everyone that she knows, she's the font of information, she can tell everyone um, where Meredith was, what she looked like, um, how she died, and also that they called the police, but it's not true. So why would you be saying that? Now, once again, if you refer to the book Darkness Descending, um, there's quite an interesting description on page... 27, uh, it's on chapter 4, which is dealing with the police investigation. Now, I'm, I'm referring to this as kind of a almost a um, neutral uh, narrative, so I'm not referring to my own narratives and what I've described there, uh, because one could say, well, obviously you're going to defend what you've said. So I'm just referring to a third source to, to just to give their version of events. And what's interesting in this um, description is how the um, authors sort of describe almost like a chain of bonfires um, across the, the Apennine peaks lighting up as information spread about this case. Um, and for two hours, there were the following police entities um, alerted. The homicide squad, the flying squad, specialist investigators, forensics, autopsy, crime scene security, senior officers, interrogators, technicians, and so on and so on. Um, and But basically the guy who was sort of initially in charge of the crime scene was the postal police dude who sort of arrived first and his name was Inspector Batticelli. And you could say that Batticelli um, was shockingly inept. In fact, he wasn't, uh, uh, you know, if he was inept, he, w- he wouldn't have summoned all these resources and he would have stepped in the crime scene and, and sort of uh, made a mess himself, but he didn't. He kind of got everyone out of the house and he... Um, he was sort of the custodian or the guardian of the crime scene and he, and he sort of protected it. He, he made sure that everyone left and that no one went into the room. Um, what should also be uh, borne in mind is that the um, police, even when the police arrived, even when the experts arrived at the crime scene, they realized they were dealing with something really 
big and difficult. I mean, they they were dealing with blood all over the place. They were dealing with um, almost an endless crime scene. And as much as Amanda Knox will tell you that the crime scene was just Meredith Kirch's room, in fact, it was a lot more. It was Meredith Kirch's body. It was the rest of the villa. It was also Rudy Gaudet's home, and it was also Solicitor's home. So you can argue and say those weren't um, crime scenes. Well, they were investigated, and uh, more than likely they also investigated Patrick Lumumba's home, and then they also investigated the downstairs area where they also found blood, and, and that was blood belonging to a cat. In, in essence, though, you had a crime scene that kind of seemed to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you soon had an army of investigators um, all dressed in sort of space suits stumbling through this very small space and trying to make sense of it. And um, th- and so because of the length and breadth um, that was just expanding of this crime scene, but also the spatial confines, you kind of had you know officers stumbling over each other and it was a... Uh, crime scene that was just asking to be compromised um, so so in that respect I think what should also be borne in mind is very early on the Italian police recognized that they were in over their heads I'm talking when I say early on I'm talking about like on the first day and they then summoned um, resources from Rome right they didn't simply just investigate the scene they basically summoned um, forensic experts from Rome, you know, the, the best in Italy, and then and then those weren't enough, and they summoned more. And so, again, when you make this breezy, sweeping statement that the police investigation was inept, um, you know, what's missing from that little assessment is, um, okay, so how could the police have done better? Uh, would it have been better if there were not 30 police, but, say... 300, you know, would, would 300 have been enough to sort of um, cover everything? And you kind of have an interesting analogy with this and the Nora uh, Corrin case, where um, the police were also criticized while the search for Nora was going on, and eventually you had like 300 people searching for her. And I would love to know how you sort of then say, I'm not, I'm not sure if the commitment of the police is good enough. And you, and you did have that. You had the police being criticized for, for praying um, and for any moment that, that anyone wasn't searching for Nora was seen as the police being unprofessional or something. It's just not a reasonable standard. Um, you know, um, at what point do you say it's enough? You know, we've got enough people working on the scene. You know, we've got special forces, we've got the best people that we can find. Do you then say, in terms of the Nora Corrin case, do you say, oh, well, because they're all Malaysians, none of them are good enough, let's get our people in. It's just, uh, it, it becomes a, a bogus argument. So, so, um, and you kind of see the same thing here. Um, in any high-profile case, there's a lot of pressure on the police to investigate and so they are going to put more resource to it and and their best people on it um, and that is what happened here and when everyone is watching mistakes do happen um, and the bra class was definitely a mistake but what about the things that weren't mistakes what about when they asked um, Knox's roommates which knives were missing and then they asked Knox, and Knox broke down. Knox, when, when Knox was asked a simple question, uh, you know, which knives are missing from this kitchen drawer, she sort of broke down, shouting and just being completely emotional. What's wrong with that? And then very quickly, the police located a knife um, at Celesto's flat, and they and then they found DNA on it, and it was very compelling evidence because Meredith had never been to the to Celesto's apartment. Um, when we go to the next section of Gladwell's spiel, he talks about the analysis of the DNA evidence supposedly linking her and Celesto to the crime was completely botched. And um, I want to spend a bit of time talking about this aspect. Um, 
once again you have Gladwell using wonderful language to to just throw a lot of the um, forensic narrative into dispute and just in one little sentence dismiss um, kind of encyclopedias of information. Um, Knox wasn't convicted because the DNA evidence was botched. She was acquitted because of dubious claims of contamination. That's a really big difference. Um, were it not for these claims, Knox wouldn't be able to trumpet the supposed lack of evidence linking her to the crime. So it's one thing to say there's no evidence linking me to a crime. It's another thing to say, well, evidence was found. Um, our defense cleverly made the argument that it was contaminated, so now that claim's thrown out, and thus there's no evidence linking me. No, the evidence linking you is disputed, and there's a difference. Um, again, this is this is the um, um, sort of alchemizing the court narrative and then turning it into a PR narrative where you say there's no evidence. And I want to refer again to the independent article from February 2014 where uh, the reporter says it's not right to say there's no evidence in inverted commas in the case against Amanda Knox. There's plenty. End quote. The um, subtext to that is the DNA alone is enough to raise questions and certainly is. Um, if we go a little bit further down the article, um, it refers to Celesto's DNA on the bra class um, that could have been a consequence of a careless police technician stepping on Celesto's DNA elsewhere in the flat and then entering the room and stepping on the bra class even though no DNA of Celesta was found anywhere. So what this person is saying is that, you know, the explanation that Celesta's DNA on the bra clasp, um, even if the technician stepped on it somewhere else, um, you still have a situation where um, what's Celesta's DNA doing in the crime scene? And why is his DNA nowhere else? So why is it only on the cigarette butt and not anywhere else? You know, why isn't it in 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 Knox's bedroom? Why why is there no Celesto DNA in Knox's bedroom? Um, why not? Uh, he had lunch there early in the day. So where's his DNA? Why is why why if his DNA should be there, why isn't it there? Um, and then it goes on, and I'm not going to go through them. Uh, there's also the mixed stain and the knife. Um, but we should really um, hover on this little aspect because this is really the kernel of how Amanda Knox was able to um, get herself um, to, to beat the charges against her, was basically focusing on the DNA and then dismissing those um, accusations and also dismissing the experts. So um, on July 2011, uh, the Observer did an article titled Amanda Knox DNA Appeal Sparks Legal Battle by Forensic Experts. And so literally what you have here is a battle of the experts. You've got experts saying uh, for the prosecution saying this is what the DNA shows and, and these are valid DNA samples. And then obviously you have experts for the defense saying, well, that's doubtful. I don't think that's a valid sample. And, and how did you collect that one? So he has a valid sample, but, but how did you collect it? Um, are you sure that that valid sample w isn't um, from that falling into that or whatever it is? So it's finding any little way for the pasta to stick to the ceiling. Um, and so, yeah, you, you're literally having just a battle of these experts saying one thing and those experts saying something else, and and then it's up to the judge to decide between the two experts. And DNA is, is quite a complicated science. Um, it can get extremely tedious and extremely complicated with a lot of scientific-sounding jargon. And in this particular case, during the appeal, you had an inexperienced judge so the judge during the first case um, knew his stuff. He was a uh, well-versed in criminal 
cases and criminal law. But Hellman wasn't. Hellman was a, a guy with a um, record of civil cases and he didn't really understand blood evidence and that sort of thing. Bear in mind when you have civil trials you don't deal with things like blood evidence and forensic evidence and DNA. You're dealing with petty scenarios of someone stole money and um, you know a car was crashed and or was a drunk driving. You don't really have that sort of um, highly technical data in civil trials that you do in criminal trials. And so you had kind of a amateur in, in terms of the criminal scenario in Hellman dealing with this very, very detailed, uh, technical, complicated stuff. And he's going to believe whatever story sounds the best. And um, he's presented with Amanda Knox. She's now dressed uh, more appropriately. She's cut her hair. She's well behaved in court. She's no longer giving off the goofy vibe, but she's giving off the sort of um, she's well behaved and well brought up and he looks at her and he thinks you know this doesn't really match I don't that's really how um, that trial was run and so it's quite an easy thing you then um, have a war between the experts and then you show the other the police experts for being inept and this is the joke of this case is that you have the police experts being showed to be inept and then a couple of months later the experts who made that claim have their lab shut down because of poor standards because of poor hygiene so you know it's it's one expert saying that another one's standards are poor or that they um, that they they're not being meticulous enough well any expert can say that about any other expert and and who's to say whose standards are, are right. Um, you're always going to have those arguments in, in a criminal case. Um, so to to look at the uh, article at in, in terms of the observer from July 2011, um, the report from the defense experts claimed that Stefanoni ignored international DNA protocols made basic errors and gave evidence in court that was not backed up by her laboratory work, uh, rendering the knife and bra strap worthless as evidence. So basically that was what the defense were trying to do is basically, especially regarding the DNA narrative around the bra clasp and knife, rubbish the um, prosecutor's experts and then you rubbish the evidence then you can throw it out you can say so this is your murder weapon okay we don't like what that expert said um, you made basic errors so throw away the murder weapon it's, thro it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater um, look at what mess they made with the broadcast let's throw that out as well and so these are two uh, artifacts that have the suspect's DNA on it and now you can throw that out and now what are you left with um, the joke is that there are no international DNA protocols. There's no sort of international body that has prescribed protocols that CSIs must follow at police stations all around the world. And amazingly, you have the same idiotic um, accusation coming up in criminal trials over and over and over again. So you'll have a lot of different criminal trials and the defense expert will say you know what um, th they didn't follow international DNA protocols and someone who's not informed about cr the criminal law or criminal situation might be alarmed by this and say oh no you, you, you've, you've, really, you've really blown it here you didn't follow the protocols well you don't have like I say you don't have international DNA protocols you have protocols that are drawn up by agencies um, some of them are are well known internationally um, but a lot of them are sort of regional um, uh, police bureaus and and police agencies and and specific police stations may have their own protocols um, certain countries may have their own conventions but it's nonsense to say that um, someone must stick to international regulations. 
I think uh, I'm not sure if this is a good example, but an analogy to this would be sort of um, say international road traffic protocols, right? Um, so you could say yes, that that makes sense. That there are international road traffic protocols. Actually, they're not. For example, you don't have the same speed limit in every country in the world. Um, you do have the protocol of a speed limit in every country in the world, but it, it would be nonsense to say that one country must stick to the international protocols of, of, of say, maximum speed limit, because there is no such thing. Um, so making that argument is quite clever, but it's also quite sneaky, because it doesn't really apply. Uh, um, apply. Um, when... Uh, When the defense case uh, wanted to bring in their experts, the prosecution asked the judge, this is Judge Hellman, to whether they could do more DNA testing. So in other words, what they wanted to do was they are now going to be criticized um, for X, Y, and Z. The prosecution wanted to be allowed to do additional testing so that they can bolster their case, so that they can say, look at this evidence, look at the, um, look at what we've done here and this is what we found and then the judge wouldn't allow that. It doesn't really make any sense, why wouldn't you allow further testing? Um, and of course this was a victory for the defense case that they were basically sealing off the narrative to, to the one test that had sort of already been done and now you can then rip that to pieces. Um, so just to go to the article, it says the decision means that an independent review of DNA evidence um, previously ordered by the appeals court and hugely favorable to Knox will stand. So in other words, um, the previous decision that favored Knox couldn't be challenged by the prosecutors doing additional testing on th this, these very important items of evidence. And so they say it, it deals a blow to prosecutors who had sought to counter the results of that review, which harshly criticized how genetic evidence has been used in the case. Um, so yeah, so Judge Hellman wouldn't allow um, the prosecutors to sort of defend or reinforce or support their case. Uh, I'm not going to um, go into the counter narrative in great detail here, it would just take too long but there is an excellent blog on the subject where someone um, refers to the the same narrative that Gladwell is using about the inept case and, and what not uh, someone wrote a blog 10 facts the makers of the Netflix film Amanda Knox don't want you to know and one of the facts deals with the track record of the um, DNA um, inspectors and the lab closing down and, and so on and so on. Um, these people were also, um, as far as I know, they were called up on charges as well, dealing with their, um, with their lab. Uh, but go and have a look at um, that particular blog, 10 Facts the Makers of the Netflix film Amanda Knox Don't Want You to Know. Um, the blog concludes that um, Conti and uh, Vesciotti didn't prove that there had been contamination. Um, according to the blog poster that Conti and Vesciotti lied to the appeal court um, and numerous DNA experts believe that the bra class is, str is strong evidence. Um, also that it's impossible that the knife was contaminated and so on. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but the claims that that the experts made when one looked closer at them didn't really stick. So they first claimed contamination and then they claimed, um, what's the other claim? I think procedural flaws. So again, it's throwing the pasta at the ceiling and hoping that something sticks. Um, and of course it was from these two that 
this claim came that how did the DNA get there? Well, it floated on a speck of dust. Um, you know, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, then in g coming back to Gladwell, he refers to Amanda Knox's prosecutor as uh, wildly irresponsible and obsessed with fantasies about elaborate sex crimes. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but it reminds one of the West Memphis 3 case, which was dismissed as satanic panic that got them convicted. Not them, they didn't commit the crime. S satanic panic is what got them convicted. Um, I also think that what's not acknowledged here is Amanda Knox herself had written about... Um, rape fantasies or someone being drugged on, on like a blog at the time and so there wasn't like no um, nothing to link this idea of something uh, some kind of sexual deviant behavior going on there's, there's a lot more to say about that but, but I'll move on um, and then again Gladwell sort of Innocently or naively, I, d I don't know which one it is, but he, s he says it took eight years for Knox to be finally declared innocent. Like, how did that happen? Um, and by the way that he explains this, it, you know, it's like, wow, it took eight years. Um, was Amanda Knox in limbo for this time? Meanwhile, um, she only served four years in jail. So if it took eight years, um, she, she only served four years in jail and... I think even before um, even before Amanda Knox was definitively um, acquitted in inverted commas, she'd already published a book waiting to be heard, which I think is quite um, quite something. You know, the trial is sort of still underway, um, and and she's writing a book called Waiting to Be Heard. Well, she didn't wait. She she wasn't waiting for the trial to 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 finish its process and, and in fact one could argue that the book itself had an impact on what people were thinking and w what not in any event um, uh, waiting to be heard came out on the 30th of April 2013 Amanda Knox was only um, uh, definitively acquitted by the Italian Supreme Court of Cassation in 2015 so two years before her case was actually over Knox had already published a book and you know she was paid four million for it so I don't really get why um, Gladwell is whining about how long it took for her to be finally declared innocent because long before she was finally declared innocent she was receiving millions for her story and she'd become like a celebrity a murder murder made me famous celebrity on the talk show circuit so um, and if if it if it was this horrible thing of you know um, it took so long to be finally declared innocent, Knox has made uh, a living a decent living talking about how how um, earning thousands of dollars and writing books and doing podcasts on this whole horrible thing about being um, eventually declared innocent. Um, I'm not really sure I understand the the criticism here of you know it took such a long time but she only spent four years in jail of, of what was originally a 28 year sentence um, so um, you know and if, if you're making the claim that this is because of the um, imperfect Italian justice system so in other words the fact that it took eight years for Knox to be declared innocent this shows how how horrendous the Italian justice system is. Well, how long did it take to get OJ to serve time in jail? How long did it take... How long has it taken to sort out the Stephen Avery mess? Um, you know, when we look at the Jody Arias trial, it also went on for years and years. Uh, the Oscar Pistorius trial also fizzled through courtrooms for se several years where you have appeals. So, you know, when when Gladwell says this, it just makes me wonder, does he know much about how criminal trials work? Does he know that, you know, when you convicted, that's not the end of the story, there, there's then an aftermath to that? 
and even if you acquitted, uh, so like um, uh, Amanda Knox was, you can then have another, uh, you know, another go um, if you can bring new information. Um, there's no, you know, you don't want double jeopardy, but if you can find other information, then you can be have another trial, and that's exactly the situation that's going on with Scott Peterson is. He wants to appeal his guilty verdict, but the question is, well, do you have, um, you know, do you have grounds? And so, trials are well known that that can span decades. Um, sometimes they are wrapped up in a short time, and sometimes that can take years. So, um, so I don't really understand what Gladwell is whining about here. Um, um, of the eight years, um, Knox was found innocent twice. So, isn't that sort of a 50 50? You've, you've won half of your court battles. And yet, it's framed in a way that it's all the Italian justice system's fault. They were, they were wrong to even take this case to trial. Um, so, 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 what should we do? So, um, you know, with other cases um, like Stephen Avery, should one just when it reaches a certain point in time, should you just wash your hands and not take it any further? Um, you know, there's no... Um, statute of limitations on murder, um, actually. So, obviously in the case of Amanda Knox, the, the, this is um, finalized, the, the case won't be heard again. Um, but in terms of other cases, um, there is no statute of limitation when it comes to murder. Um, then Gladwell goes on to say, when Knox was freed from prison, a large angry crowd gathered in the Perusia town square to protest her release. And now Gladwell is sort of sketching the scenario of almost like people with pitchforks and sickles and, you know, like this mob running down the street that are all um, on like a witch hunt, right? Um, you know, you had the same scenario with the McCanns. You had the same scenario with the McCanns where after months of a, a particular narrative, they were eventually interrogated. And this is after months of the police following what they were told to do by the McCanns. Um, they were they were then eventually interrogated and they were eventually made official suspects and the crowd were angry and the, the crowd were in a way justifiably angry because the the noise the McCanns had made had actually caused the tourism industry to implode with devastating consequences for the local hotel industry and especially in Pride de Luge and especially in the hotel where the McCanns stayed. I mean, ultimately, that hotel closed down. So, um, shouldn't the public express their opinion? You know, are they not allowed to be angry when they see things a certain way? Um, you had the same thing happen um, with the uh, John Bernay Ramsey case, in to to some extent, in Boulder, where people wanted the case to go to trial and when, when there were numerous press statements people weren't very happy. You had the same thing happening with Amanda, with the sorry with the O. J. Simpson case. When the verdict was announced there were huge crowds, some supporting the verdict and some not supporting it. The same thing with the Jody Arias trial when the verdict was announced you had massive crowds expressing their opinion. Obviously, in a, any high-profile case where it's in a newspaper every single day, really, are you going to tell me you, you aren't going to expect people to become emotionally involved and they're not going to express their opinion one way or another? I just don't understand how Gladwell can make these claims as if he's, he's not aware of how, um, how it works between you know, the public... Um, absorbing all this information over, as he as he refers to it, eight years, um, and then aren't they allowed to respond? Are the public not allowed to respond in a certain way? And you know what's very interesting is, I went to uh, Portugal this year, and people have a view on the ground of 
the um, the guilt or innocence of the people involved, and it's very different to the the view of the people in in another country. Why is that? Why is it that in the one country people feel one way and in another another way? And this is a really important question, um, especially in terms of this book Gladwell has written about talking to strangers. Why, when you go to a different country, will will the view of a particular suspect be one way or the other? And bear this in mind. I know that a lot of people would say, well, you know, um, the Italians are biased. The Italians don't like Americans. Well, there's an another. there were two other Italians involved in this crime. Um, and when I say involved, I mean they were charged, they were... Um, they were on trial. That's what I mean by involved. Um, and arguably more, three. Um, so you had Solicito, who was also Italian, and the, and the Italians f- seemed to feel that he was guilty as well. So are they also having pitchforks and whatever with one of their own? Um, Rudy Gaudet was Italian. He spoke Italian. He was um, Iv- Ivorian by birth, but he was also Italian. Um, were they r- wrong not to suspect him? Um, and so on, and the same with Patrick Lumumba. So it's almost like um, you can have a situation where the locals um, are justified in, in um, having their view on the locals, but they're not allowed to have any view on this other person, the person who's closest to the murder victim and the person whose behavior was the oddest in terms of the murder victim. It's just a very um, selective way of reasoning um, that that I don't I don't actually understand. Um, just as a as another illustration of this, you know, in the trailer for O.J. Made in America, there's a very memorable snippet where you hear a small, a, a diminutive woman. I think she's at an airport, um, seeing OJ sort of coming down, and even though there's a large crowd there, um, she screams at him in a very high-pitched, uh, agitated, emotional way. She screams at him, "You ugly murderer! You ugly ass murderer!" And then you, and then you say, "Was she wrong? You know, is she wrong to say that? Is what she's saying wrong? Is what she's doing wrong? Should she not be allowed to?" say that and and um, is is the is the actual content of what she's saying incorrect um, and you know the, what about the crowds baying for the blood of Casey Anthony and Chris Watts are they wrong so I just think the way that Gladwell is framing this idea of, of a large crowd outside the courtroom unhappy with a verdict I think that says something about the I think that says something true about the 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 whole miasma around the Knox case is that a lot of people weren't happy with the outcome, and Gladwell says he doesn't understand that he doesn't understand why that that is. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe there is an explanation. Um, and coming to that, um, Gladwell actually pertinently says the Amanda Knox case makes no sense. Um, it does make sense. Uh, if you know a little bit about Amanda Knox, it does make sense. Um, but it requires a long attention span and a, a requires a long chapter. Uh, it requires the stamina to wade through the three separate hearings. Um, and then the final one. Um, And most people don't have the stamina to do that. You know, when I reported on the Oscar Pistorius trial, I attended the, uh, the hearings. Um, and what was interesting was, in the beginning, you had the courtroom so packed that there wasn't enough room for journalists, right? Um, and over time, um, over quite a long period of time, uh, almost four or five years, you had that that attention span of the journalists whittled down to virtually nobody and when um, when the trial was eventually dismissed there was arguably no one in court in fact um, 
when I came out of the courtroom, um, the Associated Press who were there to report on another trial uh, um, interviewed me, so it's like a journalist interviewing a journalist, and there's virtually no one there, and, and it basically didn't even make the news. And, and that just shows how the stamina uh, of people to see court cases through to the bitter end is, is, is minimal, even if it's a high-profile case. Um, I think the stamina in South Africa is less than other countries just because people have a, lo um, a low threshold for crime, that they're not interested in talking about it or analysing it as much as I think in other countries, um, where crime is almost hypothetical. Um, uh, knowing about Knox's backstory as a poor girl from a broken family helps when we want to understand how the Amanda Knox case makes sense. Uh, knowing about Celesto's backstory as a rich boy from a broken family helps. Knowing about Meredith's backstory as a balanced, hard-working, well-mannered, well-brought-up, intelligent uh, person in a mixed family helps. Uh, knowing about the Ivorian's background helps. Um, knowing about um, Amanda Knox's finances and her call records and her associations with um, various people in Italy in the weeks before the crime took place helps. Uh, but if you don't know that, then a lot of it isn't going to make sense. Um, and then this starts addressing the problem with Gladwell's uh, chapter is he says let me give you the shortest of all Amanda Knox theories and then he says her case is about transparency um, that's really the problem here is that this this is trying to give he's, he's undertaken to give the shortest of all it's not just the short Amanda Knox theory or a short Amanda Knox theory it is he's endeavoring to give the shortest of all theories and that's that's the problem. It's simplistic and it's reductionist, and it's too simplistic and it's too reductionist. Um, and then Gladwell says her case is about transparency. I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means to say her case is about transparency. You know, in a situation where we've spoken about the DNA evidence, where one group says the DNA said that and then the other group says no um, it was contaminated what does that have to do with transparency um, you know when you have a situation where the victim is under a duvet under a comforter behind a locked door um, and then you have Knox herself saying to the police there's nothing strange about the fact that the door's locked. Meredith always locks her door. And then when asked about this again, then she would say, you know, even when Meredith took a shower, she would lock the door. But then her roommate, her other roommate, Philomena, says that that's not the case. Um, so so how think about that in terms of transparency. Think about transparency in the context of staging and PR and all this little intrigue that's going on. And where you say, no, no, we're not, we don't want to talk about this case. It should all be about Rudy Gaudet. Oh, really, are you being transparent? Oh, we're not going to, um, we're not going to suspect anyone because Amanda Knox said Patrick Lumumba did it. Oh, uh, uh, that's being transparent. Okay. Um, let's not discuss the Amanda Knox case. It's really all the fault of a rogue journalist called Nick Pisa. Oh, is that transparency? Is that about being transparent? Um, everything that Amanda Knox did is explainable by her being a goofy person. Is that about transparency? Oh, or is it the transparency of the Italian justice system? Is that is that being transparent? Um, none of this is true. Um, what what this really c comes down to is it's about PR. So, if Gladwell says, let me give you the shortest of all Amanda Knox theories, her case is about transparency, transparency, my counter is, let me give you the shortest of all Amanda Knox theories. And I don't think that that's something we should try to do very often. We shouldn't be 
in a competition to give the shortest version we should give be I, we should be in a effort a conscientious effort to give a compelling and credible and authentic version based on the information um, this case to me is about lost in translation it's about pretending things to be lost in translation and in Knox's own version she said she, you know when she was interrogated she didn't know what she was being asked she couldn't understand Italian she had an Italian boyfriend and she communicated in Italian with him she also communicated in court speaking Italian in the it Italian court and there's video showing her where one can hear her talking in Italian um, we also know she was reading a Harry Potter book in Italian so this whole idea that that she didn't understand what was going on um, is a argument for lost in translation and ironically that is the argument for why a lot of people believe what they believe about this particular case um, I don't think they've they've gotten lost in translation I think they've been intentionally misled by mistranslations and that actually happens to be a very uh, apt description for how America's version of the Knox case was contaminated because you literally had the PR folks for Amanda Knox translating the court transcripts as they happened in Italy for the American uh, media and for the American market. So you, you've literally got the apologists doing their little subtle n um, nips and tucks to the court narrative where you you um, enhance this word and you you minimize that one and you edit this and that and and you, so you basically create a um, subtext to to the court narrative that's not a true reflection of the court narrative that's just one example um, so it's really about playing people for fools using both sides of the fiddle um, first you rubbish the DNA experts and then you pretend there was no DNA to begin with and you count on the media to collaborate in your PR induced collective amnesia um, I've mentioned previously that the judge was a civil judge um, and that Knox's case was his first or second criminal case he, he simply didn't understand um, the blood evidence but you won't have any of them talking about that so you had headlines such as this one on NBC News saying the alleged DNA contamination at the heart of Amanda Knox appeal trial and so this this was really how the the Knox camp fought back is they 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 just hit on this idea of DNA contamination and so not only that you had that making world headlines so in America and Italy and Britain you you were just hearing about DNA contamination DNA contamination and so the, this whole case which is quite a big case involving a lot of aspects um, even involving witnesses and so many different areas um, becomes reduced to this little keyhole and the keyhole is was there DNA contamination or not can you put the key into that keyhole and turn it and if you can oh well there you go now you've locked the the door on everything else on the Knox case and in this sense the Italian justice system really helped Amanda Knox because as soon as you you dealt with certain evidence you couldn't ever deal with it again and so um, again that's not really unique to the Italian justice system but um, what effectively happened was the case was like a pizza and each time the case was reheard it, it was reduced to a smaller and smaller piece of pizza and eventually you left with one little tiny piece uh, which you then debunk and well done now you've, you've won the you've won your trial um, in the British uh, Independent on July 2011 um, the headline reads unreliable DNA evidence in Knox case and interestingly in terms of the PR or the vibe that the independent were going for is you have under that headline you have a picture of Knox sort of with a finger against her nose smiling kind of behind her hand and it's you know 
in the context of this unreliable DNA, you sort of get the sense that Knox is um, delighted with this clever little, um, um, clever and even mischievous little defense tactic. And the article goes on to say defense experts experts criticize Italian police and say some forensics were contaminated by investigators. So this whole narrative that the police were inept and what what not, that's the defense story. That's how you dismiss evidence. And like I said, it's a bit disingenuous to say there's no evidence when you saying, well, everything the police did we're going to undermine and second guess and we're going to try and humiliate them and thereby try and have certain very um, very uh, compelling evidence but also very significant evidence co completely thrown out. We're not going to talk about that evidence again because of we've now raised doubt around it. And to go back to the article it refers to vital DNA evidence used to convict the American student um, was unreliable and possibly contaminated. Independent forensic experts told an Italian court yesterday. Um, so now I'm going to give you a little bit of background into this and this is going into the Von Bredar case which I sat in on. And on the day that I arrived in the court I anticipated that Henry Von Bredar was going to give uh, testimony in chief that he was going to give a first hand version of events and instead what happened w was quite interesting is that the defense elected to ask the judge you know can can Henry be allowed to testify kind of later on you know maybe he's not going to testify but if he does can he testify later on the judge didn't like that because um, the convention is the um, defendant um, needs to testify first and then you have your experts come in and their narrative then supports his contentions. Um, one reason why you wouldn't want your defendant to go first if with a defense case is what if your um, what if what he says and what the experts say doesn't line up and th that that then ruins your defense case. In any event uh, uh, Henry was allowed to testify after his experts and um, but ultimately um, the person who kicked off the defense case was a DNA expert um, who spent days and days and days of mindless sort of testimony talking about um, international defense uh, uh, international DNA protocols and standards going on and on and on about protocols uh, going on and on and this was a situation where you had a orgy of evidence you had you had just you had hundreds and hundreds of blood samples because three people had been axed to death and you had a, a ridiculous situation where of the hundreds of samples that were obvious that obviously this person's blood or that person's blood or that person's blood there were also dozens of samples where the sample wasn't significant enough and of course that's what you concentrated on so so even though you had by far the majority of samples that were obvious the expert went on and on and on for day for hours and hours and days and days arguing about all these minority of samples, which were still many, um, that were unreliable because there weren't enough alleles or whatever it was. And her job was simply to raise doubt on anything that she could. So somewhere a sample was taken, uh, w was a protocol followed there. And in the end, something similar happened with her, was where in the same case with Amanda Knox, where they said, well, what about the DNA experts? Uh, what about their lab? What does their lab look like and do they follow protocols? And they ultimately got into trouble subsequent to their, their testimony. Uh, Olkers was also asked, well, you know, did you test any samples? You know, d uh, you've made this, this sort of case. Um, did you test any samples and, and find a different result? And um, if I remember correctly, she 
didn't test any samples because she was almost like a academic or a theoretical expert, um, not someone who's hands-on literally doing samples. Um, it's, it's almost like her ambit is to provide protocols for others but not, not literally test. So, so that was really... Um, quite strange and when the judge gave his verdict he, he really wrapped this particular expert on the knuckles um, interestingly when the judge pronounced on the Amanda Knox case Hellman he argued that uh, a judge did not have sufficient expertise to evaluate the experts opinions so that's quite an interesting concession is the judge is himself is saying I, I don't really know what's going on here. Um, these experts are arguing amongst themselves. Well, you know, I don't, I don't really have expertise to to know how how their expertise is. But like, you know, I've got to, I've got to make a judgment one way or the other. Um, if we go back to that blog that I referred to earlier. Um, What's amazing is 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 the strength of solicitor's um, DNA strain in that um, in that sample that was taken from the bra clasp. Um, it was a very very strong sample. So to argue contamination or that it you know it somehow brushed against someone's shoe um, doesn't explain why there was this incredibly clear and distinct sample on this piece of material that had been kicked around the, the crime scene, you know. Um, and then uh, to come back to Gladwell, um, he, he wants to give the shortest possible explanation of the Knox case and um, he, he refers to Amanda Knox being one of those mistakes you know, where a stranger looks and acts in a certain way and and then because you don't understand that, you're going to make mistakes. Um, and then he says, as I say, let me give the shortest of all Amanda Knox theories. Um, this is the problem. Um, it's not the first time Gladwell has been acu accused of oversimplifying and being reductionist. There's effective thin slicing and then there's cutting things too finely. Gladwell commits the latter sin with his loosey-goosey interpretation of Amanda Knox. It's not an interrogation, it's simply an opinion, and it's woefully underinformed and misrepresentative of the basic history of the actual case. Um, if you look at the um, graphic, the kind of infographic provided by the murder of Meredith Kircher dot com there basically three circles. There's a blue circle of what was presented at the Massey trial in 2009. There's a green circle of what was presented again at the Hellman trial in 2011. And then there's a sort of purple circle uh, what was presented at the Nancini trial in 2013. There should be another little circle which was the Supreme Court appeal, but that was just a case that was dismissed. It was, we want to appeal this and the Supreme Court said no and, and so that was the end of the narrative so if you look at that infographic you see one very large circle in 2009 and that dealt with all the evidence right and based on that Amanda Knox was convicted then you have a smaller circle which is less than a quarter of the size of the original circle and I've circled within that the that red that red circle. That's my circle, and that deals with the the appeal in 2011, and the very crucial um, DNA evidence on the bra clasp. And the defence succeeded in throwing that out, and as a result, um, Amanda Knox won her appeal. Right from that small little fraction of evidence compared to the first trial, and then you had the appeal of the appeal in 2013, and then the prosecution won that case, and that was when the um, a, a new knife swab was tested, and based on that information and and some other aspects, 
um, Knox is found guilty. And then, again, then the, the case was thrown out after that. So you can see how the, 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 the trial narrative deals with less and less and is becoming more and more warped and distorted because you're only looking at one item of evidence, right? And that's also why when Knox says, um, or Gladwell says, or, or any of the apologists say there was no evidence linking her, it's making that little circle very, very tiny and excluding a lot of information from your answer. And, and how transparent is that? Um, you know, if we're going to insist on being reductionist, um, how about this? Um, what if there is an explanation for Watts's ongoing, in fact, sorry, not Watts, Knox, Knox's ongoing or infinite capacity for oddness and goofiness? What if there is an explanation for it? And, um, you know, this, this aspect I've dealt with in my narratives, but one thing you can see over time is that Knox has always been goofy and odd. She's always been in a way cocky and um, um, just, I don't know, um, what's the word? I wouldn't say antagonizing, but almost prov pro provoking or provocative. Um, and you can either say that's in an amusing way or you can say it's in a way that is distasteful and inappropriate. Certainly the coaches have felt that way. Um, but um, that certainly applies to the aspect of the case was that Meredith did, did she feel that Knox craved constant attention and has that changed in 12 years um, early in, in October Meredith confided to a friend Sophie and emailed her sister about how annoying Knox had become has that changed right and then you say what kind of person is like that what, what kind of person what kind of personality and psychology craves constant attention? Where does this come from? And then one can look into childhood. Um, uh, wh why do people crave attention? Well, what happened in their childhood? You know, was there a situation where the family were broken, as in the family were no longer providing the sort of attention that, that a child should be getting? And we, we see that that was the case with Amanda Knox. She she um her father left the family when she was two years old uh, just when her, her sister was being born um the other aspects to deal with as well but we can see a reason for why knox would feel needing attention um you know from the family you know where she wasn't getting it and then translating that to people around her um and then there's also the idea that people crave attention because they feel jealous of because someone else is in the spotlight. So what happens when you crave attention but someone else has more friends or is getting uh, you know the attention of a boy that you like or whatever and you know where you could say that this is no, uh, an innocent thing in certain situations there may be a situation where um, it's not so innocent and you can have a a very catastrophic result at the end of it. In other words, the story may begin in childhood and but may manifest in a in a serious way and in a criminal way in a particular set of circumstances. Um, I'm not going to take that further. I've dealt with that in in the books, but uh, we we need to acknowledge that Knox had a unusually strict, regimented, and sheltered life. Sheltered is a word Gladwell uses as he tries to make the point that he, that he can't explain the Amanda Knox case in hindsight. Um, in his view, it's completely inexplicable, but it's not. The, the sheltered aspect really does explain a lot. Is you're having a sheltered person going to Italy where the whole idea is to not be sheltered, to, to live it up, to, to have it all, to have all, all sorts of experiences. But within, not just that, it's within the context of someone next door also wanting to have their idea of an adventure. And so you ha what you're really dealing with is you having Knox, um, who's had a sheltered life her whole life, and now she wants to 
enjoy herself and she deserves it that's her opportunity to have her adventure but at the same time so does Meredith she also deserves the opportunity to do whatever she wants to do and now you where the conflict happens is both of them interpret this idea of adventure in a different way one may see it in a mostly sexual sense another one may see it in terms of travel and 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 uh, experiences with friends and and studies you know having success success with studies and fun another one may see it in terms of things like sex and drugs and rock and roll you know um, so and 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 but both of them are in this in this place where they want to expand and enjoy themselves but at some point they had cross purposes and then and then you say, how does the one deal with the other's um, criticism of them or limiting of them or oppressing of them? In other words, you can say, when Meredith is upset, how does she deal with with being upset? And you, one could say she talks to her friend, she talks to Sophie, she emails her sister, she does X, Y, and Z, and maybe she doesn't confront Knox, she, she just lets it go, kind of thing. And then, by contrast, if Meredith says something to Knox, how would Knox respond? And in a way, we have, have an answer to that. We have an answer to when someone criticizes Knox, how does she respond? Well, how did Knox respond when she was criticized for the wedding um, fundraiser when, when they, they were already married? You get kind of big statements placed in the media and criticism and... Um, I wouldn't say attacks, but you, but but pointing the finger at other people, and justifying. So, so Knox is very um, quick to justify herself and defend herself. And you saw the same thing with the police. She made many statements, and she was, you know, um, you know. Another thing is, you're at the police station, you're doing yoga, you're outside the crime scene, and you're kissing your boyfriend. You're kind of showing that you don't really care, or something doesn't really affect you. So when you have a situation where you have someone's, you have a roommate saying, you know, I don't like this, I don't like you know, this about you, I don't like how you're doing that, how, how do you think Amanda Knox would respond, right? And then you take that answer, whatever it is, and you say, um, how would she respond if she had a new boyfriend with her? And then you take that and you say, how would she respond if she was perhaps under the influence? And then you say, well, wh wh where does that discussion take us, right? Um, and and I'm simply saying this in uh, response to where Gladwell says this case is completely inexplicable. There, there's no way we can um, explain anything out of it. It's not. And um, like I say, the, the sheltered aspect, I think, is a very important um, part of us getting to a plausible explanation. Um, interestingly now, Amanda Knox seems to be playing the narrative that she's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder 12 years after the crime, when for the past decade she's become infamous for not showing any signs of trauma and for not acting emotional at the time. So you have Amanda Knox going to Italy and crying on stage and being there are other photos of her where it looks like she's sort of um, being assailed by the media and she has her head down and it looks like she's wounded, like like an, a, literally an arrow has struck her in the chest because a reporter's pointed a camera at her. And I'm talking about now when she visited Italy this year. So you see that and you, you get the sense that she's been victimized and that she's had this traumatic experience with, with how the media treated her and yet when you look at the photos of the the court narrative you see Amanda Knox smiling in it's not it's not one day where she was smiling in court you see her dressed in different outfits um, you know striped jumper she's smiling she's wearing a um, shirt saying all you need is love and she's got a smile um, you've got the police holding her arm and, you know, and in, in, in this particular image she's wearing yellow and she's got a smile it's not a it, it seems like a happy smile it seems like um, even a 
um, satisfied smile. Um, you see her surrounded by the police, smiling. You see her standing next to her lawyer um, with a with with a big smile, and he's got a small smile. And, and the person in that particular image with the biggest smile is Amanda Knox. And there are literally hundreds of images like this where Amanda Knox is on trial for murder, but she's smiling. 